Thank you so much. And we are continuing with our study of the sanctuary and particularly the altar of burnt offering. Now let us bow down our heads for a word of prayer as we begin our lecture today. Father in heaven, we humbly request that your presence be with us even as we study this wonderful subject. In your holy name I pray. Amen. So in our previous lecture, we noticed the significance of the altar of burnt offering. And uh, you can remember, we saw, we saw that it is important that we know what this represents. We said that uh, the outer court represents the ministry of Jesus Christ and his humanity, the services he came to do as a human being. We are still talking about the altar of burnt offering. And we saw the other day that it represents the spiritual experience. The door here we saw the other day that symbolizes the decision that one has to make when you want to begin a walk with Christ, you must decide, make a decision. Because when we refer to the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. So when we open the doors of our hearts and make a decision to one, obey the commandments of God, and accept the blood of Christ that was shed at the cross of Calvary. And when we accept his rulership, his kingship, and his lordship over our lives, that is uh, symbolized by the color purple, then we begin our walk with Jesus Christ. There's a point I want us to notice. You remember that the sanctuary had only one door. And we also know that if here was the camp, the, the, they were distributed evenly so that we had three or tribes, three tribes, three tribes, and three tribes because we have 12 tribes of Israel. So at the camp, they were distributed like that. I will give you details on which tribe was on which side in our future lecture. But there's something significant I want us to know that God is giving an instruction that they only have one door. Why is it important to have only one door and not another door on this side and another door on this side and another door on this side? Jesus Christ says, I am the door. Let us read that from the book of uh, John, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus says that he is the door. And the Bible also tells us that uh, for there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So Christ is one. We can only go to God through one mediator who is Jesus Christ. And that is why it was significant that they don't have doors all over because the way is one that leads to the Father. And that way is Jesus Christ. We only have one Jesus Christ who is our Savior. Although in the world today we have several people calling themselves Christ, referring to themselves as saviors referring to themselves as mediators. We only have one mediator that is between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. We are going to see that in details when we will be talking about the, the priests and the high priest. We will see the significance of having only one door. But we are not to remain at the door. Our spiritual life must move from this door to this altar of burnt offering where we found the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren let me read Romans chapter 12 verse 1 Paul says 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we are not to remain at the decision. A lot of people make a back and forth, back and forth movement, but they don't proceed to giving their lives wholly to Christ that is symbolized by the altar of burnt offering. Christ is saying, if any man wants to follow me, let him pick up his cross and follow him. So your life must reach a stage where you pick up the cross and follow Jesus Christ. And what is happening at the cross? The old life, is to be crucified with Christ until when it is done, you can exclaim as Paul did in Galatians chapter 2 where he says, Galatians chapter 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, unless we reach at that point in our spiritual experience where we can say we are crucified with Christ, what is it that is crucified with Christ? Our olden life of sin must be crucified with Christ until when we now begin to live afresh in newness of life. We live a life of the faith of Jesus Christ who offered himself as a sacrifice at the altar of burnt offering. Now, I want us to see another significant aspect of the altar of burnt offering. And uh, let us go to our, uh, our reading. We get in Exodus 27, verse 2. It says, And thou shalt make an altar of shitty wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. So God is instructing them to build this particular furniture here that is called the altar of burnt offering. So this is an instruction that God is giving to Moses. But remember what he told them in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8. He said, he tell Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. When you proceed to 9, he says, according to the pattern which I have shown you are there at the mountain. So if this is instructed them to build, which means this is a shadow of one which is real in heaven. Because when you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, the Bible tells us that Christ is a minister of the real sanctuary that is pitched by the hand of God. So this is just a shadow of the real altar of burnt offering that is in heaven, symbolizing the ministry of Jesus Christ, especially what he achieved at the cross when he was crucified. Now there's some particular details I want us to look at. God instructed that they have uh, horns, four horns. What was the significance of having the four horns? We find this in the book of Exodus 29. Exodus 29, verse 12. Let begin with 11, says, And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood besides the bottom of the altar. So God instructed them. Remember when they brought the sacrifice, we are going to see in our future lecture about the lambs and the sacrifices that were offered. But with regards to these horns, God is telling them that they should uh, offer the bullock as an offering and after that they tap the blood and after tapping the blood they come and uh, sprinkle the blood at the what? At the horns. Why was that significant? In the book of Jeremiah 17 verse 11. Remember the outer court 
represents the humanity of Jesus Christ. Let us go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 1. It says, The sin of Judah is written with the pen of iron and with the point of diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of the altars. So he's saying that the sins of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a pointer of diamond. Iron and diamond are some of the most hardest metals that we have. Why is God using this symbolism of sins being written upon the horns of the altar with the pen of iron and diamond? Remember, this furniture is found in the outer court. And the outer court represents humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, how significant is humanity of Jesus Christ in relation to the horns of the burnt offering? Remember, the saints are being inscribed on the horns of the altar in a way that it seems permanent, something that is done with a pen of diamond. Let me read again. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of diamond. It is graven upon the table of their hearts and upon the horns of the altars. That means it is transferred in a way that seems so significantly permanent. Being transferred from them to the altar of burnt offering and specifically to the horns of the altar. Now, what does the horns stand for? I wanted to see something. Let us go to the book of Psalms 18, verse 2. Psalms 18, verse 2. You know, the book of Psalms is all about Jesus Christ. You remember when they were walking to the mouse, he began with Moses and Psalms and the prophets telling them all that which was written referring to him regarding himself. He also told them, you search the scriptures and you do not know that here I am, it is all written about me. So the book of Psalms is a foretaste of the life of Jesus Christ. Psalms 18 verse 2 he says, The Lord is my rock. And who is the rock? Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. The Bible says in the book of Acts that the children of, of, of Israel, as they were moving to the promised land, they drank water from the rock that followed them. And that rock is who? Is Jesus Christ. So referring to Christ, the book of Psalms 18 verse 2 it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So the book of uh, Psalms chapter 18 verse 2 gives us a very significant information. God is telling them to put horns at the corners of the altar of burnt offering. Why is God telling them to put the horns at the corner of the altar of burnt offering. The horns here are just a shadow, are just a representation of who? Of Jesus Christ. So these are just a shadow of the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. Remember in the outer court, we are talking about humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, how is it possible that sins could be transferred to the horns here, which are Jesus Christ? I like the language, that the symbolic language that is used in um, Jeremiah 17, verse 1. That it is written with the pen of iron and a pointer of diamond, signifying that it is something that is absolute and permanent and sure. Anything that is written, if you write with uh, some kind of stick, you know the stick may break or something like that. That symbolic language in uh, Jeremiah 17 
gives us a revelation of the humanity of Jesus Christ because it symbolizes how our sins were transferred from us to Jesus Christ in a very sure and permanent way. This could not have happened if Christ did not take upon himself humanity. No wonder the servant of the Lord is saying that humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. Because if he did not take upon himself our human nature, it could not have been possible for the sins to be transferred to the horns of the altar of burnt offering. There's another verse I want us to look at. 2 Samuel 22, 3 says, The God of my rock, in whom will I trust, he is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. So, you see the, the kind of language being used here, that he is my rock, meaning strength, and that in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. So apart from the humanity of Jesus Christ that enabled him to take upon our, our, our sins, upon, upon himself our sins, apart from the humanity of Christ, there is a symbolism here of strength. So when your sins are transferred in Christ, when your sins are transferred on the or uh, uh, are inscribed upon the altar of burnt offering, especially at the horns, it symbolizes the sins being transferred at the horn of our salvation. That is who? That is Jesus Christ. You see, when an Israelite had committed a sin and was convicted while he is here at the while he is here at the camp, then remember our first uh, series, we saw that man cannot lead himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So it is the Holy Spirit that works conviction and lead an Israelite to pick a blameless lamb. A blameless lamb here is, uh, uh, points forward to Christ the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. So after the Holy Spirit has directed your mind to Christ to pick a blameless lamb, and then you are directed to the way, remember the verse we read in Isaiah 30, verse 21, 22, that say, Thou shalt hear a voice saying behind you, This is the way, walk ye in it. After the Holy Spirit has pointed you to the door, that is Jesus Christ, that you may make a decision to begin afresh a relationship with Christ. Then you came in with a lamb that is blameless. And when you come in here with a lamb that is blameless, you could put your hands on top of the lamb, confess your sins, meaning you are transferring your sins into that lamb. And then when the blood is shed, the blood therefore is a symbol of your sins which have been transferred into the what? Into the blood. So when the blood is being sprinkled at the horn of the altar, it is as your sins are being transferred to the horn of the altar or the burnt offering. And who have we realized according to the Bible is the altar or is the horn of our salvation. That was a shadow and a symbol of our sins being transferred to Jesus Christ, the lamp of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. He's not only taking the sins from us. The Bible says in 2 Samuel, I'm reading again, 22 verse 3 says, the God of my rock, in whom will I trust? He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, thou savest from the violence. So Christ is our strength. You see, a lot of times we feel weak in our spiritual walk. A lot of times we think we don't have 
uh, enough power. A lot of times we think we don't have what it takes to move forward. Yes, you may feel that weak. When the devil comes to you with a lot of temptation, then we have to remember the horn of our salvation. We have to remember that our sins were transferred to Jesus Christ. And because of the act of the cross, what he did at the cross, we can begin to trust in him that not only are our sins transferred or inscribed upon the horn, but he is also the source of our strength. So when we attach ourselves, our weaknesses to his strength, we become strong. And so that's the challenge and the message for us today, that we should begin to think and focus about Jesus Christ. When we think about the horns of the altar of burnt offering, we think about Jesus Christ, who is the savior of the whole world. And this is where it is significant. And I find it a bit mischievous for somebody to begin to think that Jesus Christ was not, did not become a holy human being. You see, the outer court here, as I have continued to say, is all about the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, when somebody teaches you that Christ was exempt from sin, given the nature that he took, that he took the nature of Adam before fall, then the sins could not be transferred permanently from us to him, as it is suggested in the book of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. This could only be achieved by him who was God. In the beginning there was the word, the word was with God, and the word was, with, uh, was God. For him to fulfill the purposes of the altar of burnt offering, which is a shadow of the cross, Christ must take upon his sinful nature, his sinless nature, sorry, our sinful nature. And it must be an absolute nature that is capable of fulfilling the purposes of the altar of burnt offering. That is the cross. Now, my dear viewer, since Christ had given his all so that it may be made possible for your sins to be transferred, to, for your sins to be inscribed upon the altars, for your sins and my sins to be inscribed upon the altar of burnt offering. This is just telling us what God has done. God has done everything possible in order for you and me to be saved. By the death of Christ at the cross, God has done everything possible to ensure that you and me are saved. It is our responsibility, therefore, to allow our sins to be sprinkled, to be inscribed at the horns, upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And what does that mean? All our sins we must freely and absolutely surrender to Jesus Christ so that the verse Jeremiah 17, chapter 1, might be fulfilled, that it is inscribed, it is transferred permanently to Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ has allowed himself to take permanently your sins, he did not take your righteousness because you don't have a righteousness anyway. The Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. He came for your sins to take upon himself. Are you willing to give him your sins? Are we willing to surrender everything to him? Let us carry all our burdens and take it to him so that we may be relieved and have an ease so that we gain a higher experience in our spiritual life. That is the significance of the horns of the altar of burnt offering. May God bless you.
We are going to begin our reading today from the book of Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 15. We are still talking about the altar of burnt offering. Leviticus 8, 15, the Bible says, beginning with 14, it says, And he brought the bullock for the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering, and he slew it. And Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. So they brought the bull and slaughtered, Aaron and his sons slaughtered the bull. After slaughtering the bull, Moses is taking the blood and sprinkling with his finger upon the horns of the burnt offering. And what was the significance of sprinkling? What was the significance of Moses sprinkling with his finger the blood on the horns of the altar of burnt offering? We saw in our previous lectures that the horns symbolizes humanity of Jesus Christ. And what was the significance of that? We read that in the last part of uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 8 and verse uh, 15 where the Bible says, And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make what? To make reconciliation upon it. The act of sprinkling the blood on the altar of the burnt offering had a significant in that it brings about reconciliation. We see when we read in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, the Bible says, let me begin by 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us a ministry of reconciliation. So, by giving Christ to die at the cross of Calvary that was symbolized by the altar of burnt offering, Christ hath reconciled us to himself. He says in the in verse 18 it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We saw that the act of Moses sprinkling the blood round about the horns of the altar achieved something. What was achieved by that? It was reconciliation. And if this was a shadow of the cross, then the cross brings about reconciliation. So the significance of this service is to bring reconciliation between us and God. Why? We needed to be reconciled to God because when we read the book of Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, the Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So because of our sins, we had been separated from the Father, and our sins had hid his face from us. And you see, we were not created to be separate from God. We were created to be one with God. For this reason we needed to be reconciled back to God. How are we to be reconciled back to God? By the act of transferring our sins. The sins that separated us from God are transferred to Christ 
And when now Christ as a lamb is sacrificed at the cross or put to burn at the altar of burnt offering, he is not burning at the altar of burnt offering alone. Remember, he has now carried our sins. So when he dies and is burnt, then the sins are destroyed, are burnt together with him. So when that is done, our sins which were permanently transferred from us, as we saw, the, the, the act that is symbolized with a very symbolic language in Jeremiah 17, that it is written upon the horns that is Christ with a pen of iron and a beak of diamond. It has been permanently transferred to Christ, symbolized by the horns, which means when it is done that way, it is removed from you to Christ in a permanent way, you no longer have your sins. And when it is removed from yourself, and then it is burnt at the altar of burnt offering, your sins are done away with. We are going to see in our future lecture about the cleansing of the most holy place, where sins are ultimately done away with. But for the sake of reconciliation, we see the significance of this. Let us look at another important verse that I want us to I want us to read something. We are looking at the significance of the altar of burnt offering. Let's go to Psalms 51 verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. The sacrifice that God wants that is symbolized by this is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. What does he want to achieve by this? Is a contrite spirit, is a broken spirit, and a broken and a contrite heart. That is what God wants to achieve with the sacrifice or the services that were made here. Let us see something that Jesus Christ himself, referring to the service of the altar of burnt offering, we are going to get to the book of uh, Matthew 5, 23 to 24 talking about reconciliation, the significance of reconciliation as it was shadowed in the altar of burnt offering. Let us open our Bibles in the book of Matthew chapter 5, 23 to 24. Matthew chapter 5, 23 to 24. This is Jesus Christ having in his mind the services done at the outer court. He says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He is saying that if you bring a sacrifice, you come to offer a sacrifice at the outer court and you realize that there is something between you and your brother. There's some kind of uh, negativity, there's some kind of hatred, there's some kind of animosity between you and your brother. Then before the services of the altar is done, if it is brought to your memory, that you have something between you and your brother, then you are to rush back and reconcile with your brother because of the significance of this altar. There is no way we can have a, an experience with Christ that is symbolized with this service if we still have differences amongst ourselves. The biggest challenge we have today in the Christian world, in the Christian experience, is that we have a lot of people who are Christian offering their services to God, but they are not reconciled one to another. 
Another significance of the altar of burnt offering is reconciliation. Because God was in Christ, when was he in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? He was in the world reconciling, he was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself at the cross of Calvary. So here is Christ talking, having in mind the services that were done at the outer court. He says, if you come all the way from the camp, get into the door and reach at this point and you realize that there is a difference between you and a brother, then before your life gets to this experience, remember we said that this, the services of the sanctuary right from the door to the most holy place are shadows of a Christian experience where you begin to walk with Christ and then all the stages symbolize your growth in grace until you reach the most holy place experience. Christ is saying for your life to gain the experience that is meant to take place at the stage that is symbolized by the altar of sacrifice. There's a significant point, there's a significant thing that has to take place. We have to be reconciled. A lot of churches today do not grow. A lot of Christians today do not gain a high experience because we find people in our churches that do not talk to each other. Why? Because we have not known the importance of the altar of burnt offering. But remember, this is just a shadow of the cross. For us to gain a higher experience in our spiritual walk with Christ. When we focus on what Christ did at the cross of Calvary. The Bible has told us in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that at the cross... God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And for that reason, for what he did at the cross of Calvary, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are to be reconciled one to another. Now, it is important, my dear friend, to take a pause even as we continue with our study. To think around, is there anyone you are not reconciled to? If you are not reconciled, at least for all that you can remember, you need to get reconciled. Sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes you feel that you are the one who has been offended. You know, when you are offended, most of the times it is very difficult to take the initiative to look for reconciliation. But what did Jesus do? Did he offend us or we offended him? Who sinned against the other between God and us? It is us who sinned. And when we sinned, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, God sent his son. He gave his son. God did not wait until we who are sinners asked for forgiveness. A lot of times we think that it is based on our our, our initiative that we are given the salvation or we are saved from our sins. For you to even approach God to ask for forgiveness, the first step must, uh, must occur. And what is this first step? God taking the initiative because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners. Let us read this. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, let me begin with 5. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for us. When we were yet without strength, when, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does this teach us? We have not to wait until the offender comes 
for reconciliation. We have to follow in the example of who? In the example of Jesus Christ and God the Father who took the first initiative. A lot of times even in church boards and when meetings, when, when issues are brought to be discussed, even those who are offended are not feeling easy to take a, a step of asking for forgiveness to be reconciled. We wait, we wait and wait and wait until the offender. Sometimes the offender may not see the sense. But if we have to follow in the footsteps of Christ, Christ who was sinless, Christ who was offended, did what? He took the initiative that was meant to bring reconciliation. And because of what Christ did in the cross of Calvary, by reconciling us who are sinners to himself, we have to do everything possible to be reconciled by anyone. Because if we are not reconciled, I want to let you know, my dear viewer, in our spiritual walk, in our gaining of higher experience, Moses was told to sprinkle the blood at the horns and pour the remaining at the base and the whole of that service was meant to bring reconciliation because they knew that right in the camp there were differences amongst the children of Israel. And for that reconciliation to be achieved in the camp and within the people, this reconciliation was significant. As the church of God, we need the spirit of reconciliation. That spirit of reconciliation is that which will bring a spiritual bond between us and each other. If we are not bonded with each other, how sure are we that we can be bonded to God? But that can only be achieved when we understand the meaning of the altar of burnt offering, which is the cross. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And because of the act that he achieved at the cross, you are called upon to be reconciled. I want to give us another example, the function of this altar as we wind up. We find this in the book of Numbers. Well, if you have time, go and study the book of Numbers 16. 17 and 18. Here we find the story of Korah, Nathan, and Abiram. These people had rebelled against Moses. You see, when they rebelled against the authority of Moses, they rebelled against God. God did everything possible to bring them back to him, to convince them to drop their rebellion, and they refused. Until God was wrath with them, God became so angry and this, the plague broke out in the camp. And they were dying in thousands, they were dying in big numbers. And what happened? When you read, the Bible tells us, let us go to Numbers now 16, 45 to 48. Numbers 16, 45 to 48. Remember, they have rebelled against God. They have rebelled against the authority of God. When they rebelled against Moses, they rebelled against God because Moses had the authority from God. So anybody rejecting the prophet of God is rejecting God himself. And by the way, that is a very significant message to us who are the church of God, the children of God, who are living in the last days. Do we have a prophet of the Lord? Yes, we have a prophet of the Lord. Are we rejecting or rebelling against the authority of the prophet of the Lord? If you rebel or reject the messages of the prophet, you are rebelling and rejecting God himself. Now, uh, these gentlemen, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they had rallied a group behind them in opposition against Moses. And Moses had nothing to do and he had to leave it with God. Now, God took uh, action. The plague broke in the camp, and they were dying in numbers. Now, they are dying, and there's nothing that they can do. Now, listen to what God is doing. In Numbers 16, he says, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly, 
unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. So God is looking at the condition that the whole generation is going to be wiped out. Although there are the people who rebelled and sinned against God, God is taking an initiative to save them from the penalty of their rebellion, from the consequence of their rebellion. God is instructing Moses to tell his brother Aaron to take a censer. A censer is a mini altar of burnt offering. It is a movable altar of burnt offering that could be moved from this point to this point. We are going to see the function of the censer on this apartment in a future lecture. So the plague has broke out in the camp. They are dying. So God is instructing Moses to instruct his brother Aaron to pick up the censer and run to the camp where the plague has broken out. Because they are dying, they are going to be wiped out. What does that tell us? The love of God, because the Bible says, for God is not willing that anyone should perish. This is a characteristic of God. My dear friend, God is not willing that you and myself be lost in sin. And because of that, he is not delaying, he's not taking chances. He's telling uh, Moses is telling Aaron to run because if he delays then the whole generation is going to be wiped and God is not slack as some people count slackness. God is swift in matters relating to your salvation and my salvation and he will run with speed to offer an incense and what does the incense stands for? The incense is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now he went and between the dead and those who are living, the righteousness of Christ interposed. And when the righteousness of Christ interposed, came in between sin and them, those who had not died were rescued and they did not face the wrath. What we need is the incense that symbolizes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to come to our aid. And that is made possible by what he did at the cross of Calvary that is shadowed by the altar of burnt offering. God is working everything possible. Not just working everything possible, he is acting with speed. Remember he's telling Aaron to run so that the plague does not wipe many in the camp. And so God is going to move with speed. I wish we had our eyes opened to see how God is moving with speed, especially now that we are living in the last days. You see, a lot of times when we look at what is happening in the world, when you look at what is happening in the ecumenical world, how the devil is working with the Jesus and all the movements, how they are working with speed, we think that the Lord is quiet and silent. The Lord is working with speed to ensure that as many as possible are saved from the destruction that is going to come. And he's calling his people to come out of Babylon. Are we willing to cooperate with him in what he's doing with speed? Are we going to catch up with the speed of God in bringing our salvation and extending the salvation to the rest of the world? May it be your desire and my desire to work together with God, not just slowly, but with speed to ensure that the world is not lost. May that be your desire and my prayer in Jesus' name.